Hi, it's Mark Lowe with Kentucky Tennessee Research. Yeah, join me now as we talk about fraternal organizations, groups of people bound together for social, religious, and even educational opportunities. This session is entitled Masonic Lodges, Odd Fellows, and Secret Societies. Listen now. <music> Well, welcome. Today we're going to talk about Masonic Lodges, Odd Fellows, and Secret Societies. And obviously you know something about the terminology that we're referring to, but these are always an interesting discussion. I mean, I grew up with uh, a father who was uh, a member of the Masons. Um, I've been to many Odd Fellow cemeteries, and I've heard about secretive organizations for various time periods. We'll talk about those, but the whole concept of this is building upon fraternal organizations. And literally, the advantage of that for us as researchers is that fraternal organizations bind people together uh, who have a common social interest or a religious interest, philosophical, or sometimes um, even, uh, I don't know, a charitable or philanthropic. And so their purposes are building on a community level. and. By, by putting folks together and learning about the organization and those other folks who uh, participate, then that's part of understanding the neighbors and the situation and community where folks are living. But the organization have minutes and records in most cases. And let's look at the availability of those and the kind of information that we can obtain and locate by looking at these records and where we might find other clues as well. Now. Freemasonry, which is one of those and is a, a very historic group, this is an example of the various types of degrees and the rights. And from an apprentice level at the bottom, moving all the way up to um, each category or each right has degrees. So Scottish right you may refer to, uh, have referred to, or York right. So it certainly is helpful to have an understanding of what the purposes are and how a person moves from one level to another in this process. This is a great organization in the sense of, of the style uh, of looking at the information and just following the group. And it might not be that, it may not be able to uh, do that in every case of every organization we run across, but Freemasonry is widely discussed and it would be fairly easy to locate it. And in fact, you're going to find that sometimes some of the best information may just be by asking someone there uh, in the organization locally. I've given you some links to those in the handout and I suggest you follow those and, and look at some of the broader links and informational to maybe perhaps learn more about something of interest to you. Now, certainly historical, this is from the Hazen Company in 1908. It's a book publisher, but they were uh, really specialized in fraternal and religious organization publishing. And so they often did this type of, uh, of artwork that uh, builds upon that same thing we talked about of the degrees are moving through categories. Almost every organization that's been around has had to change over time. To give you an example here, for example, in regard to Freemasonry, in North Carolina, there were lodges already in place before Tennessee actually became a state. So there were what they called pioneer lodges. That's the ones that would have come here earlier, and they have larger numbers. So as an example, these are some local ones near to me, and I just wanted to show you how they cross over. The original pioneer lodges Harmony Lodge number 29 was number one in the Tennessee Lodges once they created the, um, the Grand Lodge of Tennessee, number two, and so forth. And of interest locally to me, for example, if you go all the way to the bottom of that list, Western Star Lodge, number 61 of the Pioneer Lodges was actually number nine in the Tennessee Grand Lodge. It's still an active and local uh, Masonic order here. So as we look at those, sometimes looking at the history, know that they can go back as, uh, you know, 
as, as long ago as being a part of a North Carolina Grand Lodge, and usually the Grand Lodge is the state level lodge, at least in the Masonic order. And fraternal organizations, again, bind folks together. Many of some of the earlier ones really evolved into mutual insurance companies. This is a Woodman of the World. And so often as we look at photographs, uh, they, they tell us not only some things about the symbolic order, but they tell us about the individuals who are involved in those groups. For example, one of the other ones is the owls. And you might ask, I like that, you ask. And as we come across these historically and look at some of the modern things today, we're able to learn more about the organization. And sometimes they may seem almost ridiculous to us looking at them in one sense. But understanding the concept of the kind of the fraternal organization, things that they had in common, and these costumes or uh, not costumes necessarily, but ceremonial outfits in some cases, help us to understand a little bit more about the organization. Many of these organizations, though, did begin as benefit groups uh, or mutual insurance. And this goes all the way back into the 16th century in Europe, where benefit associations provided payments for families upon the death of a member. As we look at that, though, Understanding, first of all, and our first step probably, would be clues that an individual was a member of a fraternal organization, okay? And those would be items laying around, the things that we look at. It could be found in biographies. It could be found in their clothing and jewelry. There could be a family tradition or story that's passed around. It may have been uh, indicated in their obituary. We may find things in their personal papers, and certainly temple, uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me, symbols on tombstones or uh, flag markers, as they're often called. We might even find a book uh, that mentions the organization. We'll often find membership cards, and we'll look at an example of some of these uh, as we go through this, which is often what I think is the doorway for us to ask the question, what is the organization and what can I learn about it? And why was the person we're researching a member? And what does that tell us about that individual? Here is a biography from Goodspeed's History, which is one of those what we call a mug book from the 1880s. And this is a farmer from Murray County. This is in uh, southern Middle Tennessee. And if you'll go through, you, you're welcome to read the rest of that as he talks about his history and the participation in the Civil War, etc. Um, he's a Democrat, but he is a Freemason. So it's included in that biography. So from a result of looking at that biography, we can look closer into that organization. If he was a member where he was located there in, um, in Murray County, which is now the city of the Columbia, that area, then we could identify the lodge number. We might be able to look at membership records, and we could begin to look at the records uh, perhaps of the, of the individual, and we'll go through that process a little more as we get into this. And one of the other groups, sometimes the ones that I think are interesting that get confusing to me are when we find these, these badges, often for a, uh, attending a conference or organization, just like many of the genealogical conferences we see today, people wear ribbons and, and banners, but this is a little more formal. Uh, but this is the Junior Order of United American Mechanics, uh, Mechanics, J-O-U-A-M. And notice that if we find this, then often it refers to a specific chapter or council, in this case the Middletown Council Number 156. So sometimes there'll be more official badges, others will find souvenir of a particular lodge meeting or a reference or a conference with the same sort of information. And they may vary from year to year or they may have one style and stick with it. Either way, if we'll do a little bit of research and our access online with some of the sources I gave you and more, we'll learn a little bit more about the organization and how they developed and how they developed these badges and particular emblems and symbols. Certainly one of the older ones that's been around, this is a Nashville group, the Knights of Pythias, uh, Centennial Lodge number 94, and this is a member's pen. And uh, we can go, uh, get a little closer and understand a little bit more about the letters, the symbol, the emblems. Everything that's represented there helps us understand a little bit more about the organization. There's a time period when we did this, though, that 
even though uh, we had these organizations, there was some sentiment against groups, and in particular the Masonic Order. And we know that it became involved in some of the national politics. So there are times that these are very popular, and there may be times that the numbers were declining for information. International Order of the Odd Fellows, the Three Linking Rings. Uh, often we see these on gravestones, and again, these are, in this case, an officer's badge and a, and a um, souvenir badge for attending a conference in 1912. So if you actually found that ribbon in your grandfather's trunk and in that material, or great-grandfather's as you were going through it, you might suspect that he was a member of the Oddfellows and obviously attended this Grand Lodge session in New Haven, Connecticut. With that date and information, we could follow up with newspapers. We could look at the Grand Lodge records. We might identify the local lodge that he might would have been a member of in the community where we were. So again, these are often doorways or starting points that we need to investigate more closely to understand. Now these are some that, uh, that have been handed on handed to me by friends or they found or they've asked. So this is an example. This is the front and back of the same card. And this is not only a business card, but um, it's his membership in one sense too. P.A. Hazel Riggs from Nashville, District Manager of the Modern Woodman of America. Okay, He has an office number and office information. But the back of that is talking about the circumstances and it was an insurance, a mutual benefit group. And are you a modern woodman? Why not? So in other words, uh, this, which is a business card, also is a calling cord for information about the organization. You don't always find these, but occasionally as we dig through these and talk to folks, if you look at things, you may find things that were like old, just in nature, but this is the 1892 uh, revised general laws of the Knights of Pythias. So, in other words, that were approved nationally, and for the person to have a copy of this, they would have need to have been involved at some point, probably, with the organization. So, again, once we know who the potential person is, and we know the potential lodge and the dates that they would have been involved, it helps us to make a plan to actually access records and learn more about the individuals. Now, Charles Snyder the member indicated here of the Locomotive Engineers and Conductors Mutual Protective Association, again reminding us of uh, the collective benefit of this group. This is a 1928 membership paid card. And the information here tells us that Charles Snyder, well, this doesn't have anything about the local group. It says it's in the Ford Building in Detroit. So, it, but where did this come from? And let me just say, this card, was found. Uh, my parents purchased a house when I was uh, in middle school. And it was an old house in the community where we lived, and it was kind of a silent, uh, silent bid, or not a silent bid, but a closed bid. My dad submitted a bid and, and actually won the bidding, and we, we purchased the house. And in this house, the Snyder family, which was a wonderful group of folks, uh, so much of the stuff had been left in there. And it was a very interesting family, and this was Charles, the, the man who had lived in the house for a period of time. At this point in time, he had died, his wife had died, and his uh, one of his daughters was the last people, uh, person who was living in that house. His oldest son had moved away, and his other daughter had moved away. So there were lots of loose things like this that they, they weren't interested in uh, collecting. For one thing, they were older at that point. So he was... A, a person who lived in Tennessee, in Cedar Hill, Tennessee, and he actually worked for the railroad. So this group, this insurance group, would have been uh, involved more, more with folks who were engineers and who worked with the railroad themselves. So actually that, his card, and many, he was involved in several organizations. Um, you'll see <laughs> as I shared through that. So these are the kind of things we found in the loose papers. Uh, here's his clerk's receipt for membership as Modern Woodman of America, uh, his benefit assessment, and uh, the funds for payment, 
and the uh, individual who signed and it was uh, a camp number and all that information is there in the year and then it's stamped he worked he worked in the Ellen and Railroad Depot in Cedar Hill and so uh, to, to the date of the payment here it was just stamped on there which is kind of a neat thing historically to have a copy of that date statement but tie it back to the individual the organization and the group he was involved with now notice we, there's been several of those that he's been involved with and this man was involved in several organizations so here's yet another one with uh, he and his wife who were members of the Myrtle Lodge number 82 the Knights and Ladies of Honor they met in Nashville Tennessee and so this is uh, would have been a train ride in the time period this is 1905 and so uh, this was the marking of their dates and when they went uh, their dues and so they had monthly dues and I don't know if whether this included a dinner and a dance and that sort of thing based on how uh, how, how it appears and so this information of record is something that was found in their loose papers in their household notice the same guy involved in much uh, mutual multiple organizations over time which was not rare and so as I continued, this is the next year. So they may not have been involved until 1905, and then uh, they were definitely involved with a dollar and seventy-eight cents a month. That was their dues. Now, how can I find out more about them? And there's lots of places. I don't want to say this is the only place, but the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. Whether you go through uh, this LOC Nuckmuck connection, or whether you go through WorldCat. Or do a general Google search. You're searching creative, creatively for the name of the organization and perhaps more about uh, its members and what they stand for and the dates that they were in place. Obviously, you're trying to narrow it down to something more specific. And so, using these manuscripts that are housed in special collections and libraries all over the country, they we may find something near to us. Or something that will help identify more about these organizations whether they're a regular Masonic group an odd fellows a fraternal group a mutual benefit society or some sort of secret group or some other smaller club we will find some information about them we use a word list generally to narrow our search and as we go looking for information think about using whether using uh, Nugmuck or Google a combination of names and locations perhaps even families uh, we can change the order of the search term we can definitely combine the related surname if we're going to include that in these with the location and if we want to only focus in a particular location we can specify or combine a repository location and perhaps you've learned some of the real ticks and uh, tips and treats of working with Google and other search engines but if not take the time to, to learn some of the backgrounds on you know how to improve your search techniques now, upon this ran right across this information this is available at the Tennessee State Library and Archives so consider the state archives or state library where these would have been found <clears throat> this is a microfilm or of manuscript same thing 664 which is a particular lodge, the Castle Hall Rowena Lodge Number 21, which was the Knights of Pythias. It also included the Howard Lodge Number 13, International Order of Oddfellows records. This is in Sumner County, which is the Gallatin area. There are three volumes of these records, uh, and it specifies within this collection it's only microfilm. And what this means is these records were lent to. Uh, the Tennessee State Library and Archives or some group to microfilm them and the originals return to the organization and that is not an uncommon situation often um, to eliminate storing something that's a private manuscript or a private record that they might film them to have access to them and then return them so in this particular case there's three volumes of original records it's one reel and so they have primarily the minutes of the meetings and the officer's roll book. So the only way to look at this, this one has not currently been digitized, but it's available. So if that's the case, this might also be available at, uh, we might check other regional repositories and including family search. And so know that, that uh, when a record has been digitized, 
that they're easily accessible, but microfilm is still a way of preservation, and we don't need to ignore the fact that many records are available to us that way. It may be interlibrary loan, or have somebody, uh, the next time we go visit that library, just make a note of it and say, hey, I want to see that microfilm. Now, over the years as I've looked at these <clears throat> records, not only do uh, the records appear with minute books, etc., but there are many photographs that have been preserved in a lot of locations across the country, and they're worth looking at. I, I blew up just one little section of, uh, of this particular group for you to see the mod, uh, Modern Woodman of America, uh, 1241, so that you could actually see that when you find a picture, zooming in on it shows us lots of information. Notice they're carrying their axis, which is, again, part of the symbolic effort of what they represent. So as we look through these, it may include lots of information as we're searching online or we're searching through manuscript collections. Make note of what the collection consists of. Is it books? Is it minutes? Or are it photographs? In addition to finding folks, sometimes we will find what um, the certificates of individuals. And often those, this particular one is one that came up in connection with a, um, an estate, the settlement of a state, which is the beneficiary of this certificate, and it tells us a little bit about it as a member that he has a death settlement and payable to Lillian M. Ferguson. So in this case, the information tells us that Lucian and Lillian Ferguson are husband and wife, and that he was a member of the Woodman of the World at this particular camp and the information. It's kind of neat to have this, but this was filed uh, in reference to uh, to get his death benefit from the George B. Davis camp number 292 at Athens, Georgia. So as we look at the information, everything builds upon each other. And of course, you'll actually enjoy the circumstances studying the symbols, the emblems, the things that make up the certificate, and then what it means in particular. Now, some of the some of the otter, otter groups sometimes, as I say, can be laughable to us today, but they were to uh, build some fraternal groups, some bonding in the situation. We have uh, some of the red man group, and there are various types that may dress as, in this case, um, as though they were Plains Indians or some type of Indian group. No connection directly, but it's it's a way of recognizing some aspect of what they perceived. Uh, of, of Native Americans and then trying to project that into a fraternal organization. You'll be surprised and they're really interested in, in, in looking at the groups and what they stand for. Some groups though as they are established are, are there to connect people not only to each other but to a bond with the country in the sense of perhaps they are uh, from a foreign nation and they really want to show their patriotism and that they're, you know, really true Americans in the sense. And Foresters of America is one of those similar groups, but there are uh, lots of groups that are really focused upon folks from a particular nation, whether that would be the Hibernians or uh, there's an Italian group that's Americans like this. And uh, this is the ones from, I believe, um, yeah, Principe Oil Pimente. Um, which is a um, from the mountains of Italy. And so Foresters of America, the majority of these members, this was an Italian-focused group with the intent of having them more involved in the social aspect of the new country. Very fascinating artwork. And then that's a flag holder, as referred to, at a gravestone that would identify more in that particular unit. And, and really, as I got into this, was interesting group, and they had lots of goals toward their involvement with business and, and chamber activities and, and being a part of the community, which is not unusual for a fraternal organization. Pasquale, Pasquale H. Bennett. Now, again, I refer you back to biographical information because if we do find an organization we can go back to county histories and look at the lodges that existed in that location over time 
Certainly we can see this one from Essex County, New Jersey. Mr. Fox, member of the Grand Fraternity Lodge Number 6. And he's, again, a member of several there in the process. Now, if we look at the biography, we, we may find a, something more about him, where he came from, and that may help us understand more about the groups that this individual belonged to. I don't know about you, I enjoy reading the biographies, uh, even if they're not completely accurate sometimes, but it helps us understand a little bit more about, about them at that time period, what was going on, political situation. Politics certainly played a role in fraternal organizations. It's, it's belonging, a sense of, of uh, being a part of a larger group. All of those things are questions we should ask as we're studying this about why your individual perhaps was or was not involved and what that would have encountered in the community. Let me go back to my hometown again, <clears throat> just for a little bit, at the access of what I grew up with. And as a young man, having access to, to review some of these records when I got older and got interested, the Thomas McCullough Lodge, number 302, um, F&AM, a Masonic Order, in Cedar Hill, Tennessee. Now, this is a, a minutes of their group, and so the members that were present, written down the left side, visitors, and basically there's the uh, minutes there in front of us and the officers at the top and the date. And this was bound in a book, and at some point this organization merged with another group nearby because they stopped having lodge uh, at this particular one. It's called the Thomas McCullough Lodge, who happened to be um, uh, the state um, officer at some time in the past, and so when they had a lodge later, they started it. But often you'll have discussions of communications about the death of someone or their appointment or special things to be uh, that need to be accomplished. I think one of the one of the most interesting things is where they are uh, having the drapes ordered the three great lights to be draped. It's found here about three-fourths of the way down. In memory of our beloved Grand Secretary, John B. Garrett. So those type of things, sometimes there's even more information about helping take care of a family or that sort of thing. The minutes are where we get down to kind of the nitty-gritty. Now, hopefully, if the organization has them and has them preserved, again, they are private records. Uh, they may be willing to let you, if you know, if you had a member in the family or somebody in the past, they might be willing to let you access the records for a time. If they're not local, they may be held at the state organization, uh, the Masonic Order, the Grand Lodge. Sometimes these have been microfilmed, but often they're just held as the uh, permanent uh, records. And again, we need to ask and look for the ways to get access to them. I know we want them to just be available, but again, that may take some so a little effort on our part to get access to them. Now certainly, uh, this would also refer to visitors, which I thought was really interesting. So not only did it deal with the local lodge, but there were folks here from uh, Watertown, which is uh, over in Wilson County, and somebody here from Simpson County Benevolent, uh, Franklin, Kentucky. So they had out-of-state folks actually attending this meeting in Little Bitty Cedar Hill. Now, it was on the railroad, so it was accessible from lots of places fairly easily. These memorials, though, I think are often included in the records. And for those of us who recognize the importance of, of death and the records that they lead to us, and, and particularly before the time we may have uh, vital records, then their membership records may help us often uh, with the proof of the death or other information in their family, or sickness, as a matter of fact. Now, speaking of death, let's just take a little excursus for a second and look at some of the variety of grave markers, uh, flag holders, that we might see representing the organizations. And again, always look to see if the organization is still current. If so, look for the records there first, and then any local organizations are most likely to hold local records than that would be at a national organization. But certainly you can always ask and find out what the status is. Uh, the Knights of Pythias, both on the stone, as you see there on the left, or as a flag holder, which is on the right. So uh, with the words meaning something important, and, and so this person wanted to be 
um, or at least the family recognized his him being a member of the Knights of Pythias and wanting the information included. Again, Odd Fellows, this is a flag holder referred to, and the three linking rings and the letters FLT, Fellowship, Love, and Truth, the All Seeing Eye. Anyway, the M the emblems, the symbols, all have meaning within the organization. And so it's likely that we're going to find this. And if we do a little bit of studying, we will learn what most of them are, uh, at least to the general audience. The Masonic emblem. And again, when we find that, one of our thoughts, particularly if there's nothing else about that person, we could go look at the records for that individual in the local Masonic Lodge or even biographical data in a local county history that may mention uh, this individual's involvement in the Masonic Lodge or his order. Again, modern, modern Woodman of America and there's Woodman of the World and there are lots and lots of other organizations of similar names. So, um, as you look through one, you may have to do a little bit of investigative work to determine what is this place called? Because it may be that we're trying to narrow it down to one of the national groups and it might be a regional group. So if you find, find something, do some general searches before you begin to identify it until you match it up closely to the same item. Uh, this one is a little different. Uh, this is the Grange we're probably more familiar with, but that was actually the Patrons of Husbandry, our farming organization. And this is similar today to the Farm Bureau, which is a more membership organization today, and there still is the Grange. But the Grange did more, and perhaps you saw some of the Grange meetings on uh, Little House on the Prairie, where Charles Ingalls attended uh, as a Grange officer at one point. So it was the collective interest of farmers in an area, and so it was an organization well throughout the Midwest. Part of the Oddfellows organization, and um, I first, I think, learned about this watching the um, uh, New Year's Day Parade, the Tournament of Roses Parade, because often they had a float by the Oddfellows and Rebecca's. And even though they existed, I was not as familiar with that organization here very big in the West and I'm sure across the country uh, that uh, that's a female uh, membership organization similar or an associate group and again they all have grown and changed the Shriners again affiliated with Masonic order uh, but may have slightly different symbols a tree, <laughs> our woodman of the world, and it, uh, the difference in the style. So often, if you find a big rock, lots of these symbols may not be what's recognizable to us, but often, as a member of the organization, if it was a mutual benefit society, not only did it include perhaps a cash payment at the time of your death, just like an insurance policy, it may also have included the burial benefit of a gravestone. So that's, that's why you often will find these um, in, in the similar style that were being purchased at the time. It's always great information to go into a uh, cemetery and just begin to learn and find what's there. That's really what its discovery is all about, right? <laughs> you know, as we get to... Uh, to get to searching in the last few minutes, let me let me focus on uh, where to go in that process and begin to look. Again, if we have a location and or a lodge uh, um, and a number and a type, then we can use all the other resources we have access to. And I want to just show you some examples of that. For example, the Myrtle Lodge that I mentioned. Here's a 1914 description in the Nashville Tennessean about the KP Knights of Pythias lodges are finally joined that two lodges had merged together and there's Robert Henry uh, who is the grand commander uh, of the consolidated group and there's the discussion of the officers and information and so once we have that then one of the great things too is even if we have officers without a full membership list 
we begin to see the type of people who are a member of the organization. And that will help us understand more about the ancestor or person that we're researching, begin to narrow our focus and understand more about the potential for finding information. Now, so keep looking at newspapers. Um, look in the time period, for example, the time period that we were researching, we were focused on that and, and finding that information. Uh, but this is talking about in 1905, that's the time period that Mr. Snyder was involved. And so as we're looking at the details, we're getting information about what the lodge meetings were like, um, what's happening, and that sort of uh, information. And they're referring to the Myrtle Lodge being the mother of those. So we can also look for other lodges in the area. And then sometimes it's trying to find out where they are. And I realize that's part of the difficult part of the process and, and records. I mean, the lodges may not exist anymore. And so we can do general searches for the lodge type or in the location. And we're, we're likely to find advertisements, at least in the time period, the early part, early part of the 20th century, for new members. And that will help us to begin to find where the lodges were, where they meet, time period, some of the people involved, and then we can identify that. And I wanted to show this one as well because this is actually an advertisement for the members to show up in full uniform to attend the funeral of our late brother, F.A. Irwin. And so, again, that's another situation is that they would be posting for honoring uh, their late brother Irwin, okay? And we'll find, again, photographs, notes in the minutes, etc. So it's, it's like many, many of the possibilities of our research. It's using the multiple possibilities of where records exist and both newspaper accounts and manuscript collections to get a better picture or to get a more full view of the discussion. Now, CD directories are another one that I can't leave without at least pointing them out. I won't go into a lot of detail because I think you know how to use them. But in this uh, 1898 version of Polk's St. Paul uh, directory, which is digital, it's online, uh, I just went to one section just showing the top little section of the societies, benevolent, charitable, and religious. And they have various categories under there. So just take the time to look at the ones in your area and see what's there. Notice that many of these, uh, by sound name, I, I try to pick an area to show that, that these were associated perhaps with some German focus and or Hebrew Relief Society, King's Daughters, Luxembourger Brotherhood. So again, this is a wide open opportunity to find a lot of information and lots of fraternal orders. And so once we identify the groups or the people involved and in the groups, then we're on track to learn more about them. Now I want to remind you of uh, whether we're looking at fraternal organizations, lineage, etc. To remind you of those types of organizations, those are the bonds that are created. And often with these, it's a fraternal bond. It's just they have a, a similar thought in, in um, society or a similar charitable idea. Others are lineage by nature, and those we're more familiar with, and, we, and uh, particularly with uh, later groups like DAR and SAR, and those that attach to some specific person, and then you're a descendant of that person. But the ones we're looking at generally fall into the fraternal organization, those for which they are associates for multiple reasons, including political. So as we look at those organizations, think about the connections and how they might contribute in a living circumstances and in their organization. I can tell you that finding a photograph and often identified of members is a great way to, uh, and a great place often, to obtain photographs of someone that you can't obtain a photograph otherwise. So certainly it's going to take a little more searching and I can't guarantee they'll be there. But it was not uncommon for officers for many fraternal organizations and often large group, um, and, and particularly I pulled the military veterans out just for this example, that all of a particular unit might all have their pictures made if they showed up in circumstance and often identified. In some cases not still great photographs. So consider that possibility of what else 
and another reason for obtaining these might be photographs of those individuals. You know, I actually have, and I should have scanned it just to show you. My dad, as I said, was a uh, in the Masonic Order, and he was a Shriner. And when he went to Nashville, along with about 200 other people in his, quote, uh, class, initiation class, he was there for two days, I have the picture of him with all the people, and they're all they're all named. Every individual is identified. So all the people who went in that same pledge class, quote, that he did, and the folks who served them, just like this picture you're looking at now. So again, now, I may not have lots of information that they would have about him, per se, and that's because of the nature of the organization. But he was active and he was a participant. So again, uh, your individual may have been heavily involved, it may have been slightly involved. That may vary the information and connection to the person we're talking about. So we're going to collect these in regard to fraternal records because that's what we're talking about now. But it works both ways. So I'm going to tell you that if you listen to my session uh, that's available free on Vimeo, about uh, lineage organizations, and you'll see this, that I'm going to tell you, here's the strategy for finding records, okay? And you want to pull these out and take this list and jot down. It's simple, but if not, remind yourself of it. If the organization is still active, it is, if it is an active fraternal uh, or benefit organization, contact them. Now, they may still refer you locally, but Contact the organization. It'll give you some understanding as to its organization style, its origins, its history, the kind of records they may have uh, uh, nationally, and that sort of thing. If the organization is still active or not, secondly, also check with the State Archives or State Library in the area where the lodge or organization existed. Now, in every case, those would not have been passed to uh, another location. It may not have been a state level library. So if it's a large city, it might be at a, a library within that city, like Nashville, large enough to have uh, a large public library system. And there are records held uh, in that system as well. So if not state level, consider the regional and local libraries. Also look for manuscripts and special collections. These may fall into the university category uh, or other private organizations as well. So we can use NuckMuck, we can use uh, Google, we can do search engines across that, and certainly WorldCat, looking for the organization and their records. And also both scrapbooks, almost every organization uh, would have kept some sort of scrapbook or notes, and those may tell us lots of information. Consider museums, because it may be that these have been passed over to a museum or a historical society, and they may have the records and certainly uh, be, would be willing to allow you to access them, perhaps, uh, depending upon uh, the situation and how they obtained them. Newspaper accounts. Use all the commercial sites. Use Chronicling, Chronicling America. Consider looking at, uh, at libraries on microfilm in your area if you have a particular time period uh, that you're wanting to access. And believe it or not, personal collections, it is amazing to me the wide variety of things that people hold, if you're just like me, I, I fight every day not being a hoarder. <laughs> but the fact that I am, or that my family is a little bit, um, that we've held on to things they used to call us pack rats. I don't keep everything, but there's a tremendous amount of information there. In fact, there's a little bank bag that's just right, uh, right beside my computer. That I'm looking through and I noticed this if I look through there I did the other day there's a little charm a coin that it's on a ring of course when you want to find it you can't and it's about a fraternal organization or it's about um, and I have lots of stuff like that you know you do too but here it is I know this was on a key fob, and that would have been a pocket watch key fob ring. The, the fob and the, and the chain was broke. But there's a coin with a hole in it, and I don't know whether that was original. 
but it is um, a coin about an attendance at a one of these national organizations and it was in Chicago and I know that it belonged to my grandfather it was one of those junior organizations of mechanics and he was involved with the railroad so again even though I have that the personal collection I need to do the research to determine his connection with the group and the location the history was it a literally a fraternal group or was it a benevolent organization was it an insurance uh, purpose group etc if it's hereditary in nation and most of these are not they're, they're fraternal but there are some national groups that really have listing of these uh, hereditary societies and do know that that there are some fraternal groups that have alternate groups once you're a member then they actually say that then then their children or the legacy uh, can join and there's a great site to find those if they have an hereditary connection that's a way to find them okay okay so learn the history of the organization if it's one of the early groups see if its connection goes beyond the state where it is today if it goes back to a a mother state for example just like our western star number nine lodge was originally North Carolina Western Star number 61 makes more sense to call it the Western Star at that point it was far west as they thought about it um, today it's in the middle quote middle Tennessee uh, think about how fraternal organizations were created and what the purposes were it bound people together for social reasons or religious reasons philosophical or philanthropic and that many of these uh, societies evolved into mutual insurance companies that was certainly example with a large number of organizations after the Civil War for African Americans and and uh, former slaves and and freedmen as well of a chance to get ahead and there were many benevolent organizations for that purposes and so understand and some are female in or in origin and style some are male groups and so look at the variety that exists changes over times look at their purposes uh, studying more about the individual the records may include photographs may include minutes the discussion of what they were doing in a service project same thing as newspapers often their minutes might be reported in the newspaper at least their service work so depending upon the organization you have a wide variety of choices identify the group determine if it still exists uh, understanding why the organization did exist and its purposes will help you if it had an insurance benefit that would certainly be proven if a member was involved in, if your ancestor was a member at the time of their death then there would have been an insurance payment in their estate so again all of these things will help us learn a little bit more about those people we call family and perhaps uh, understand maybe some of their thinking depending upon the organization and its concept I would say don't let it aggravate you don't get crazy about it and it, and there are secret societies definitely if you find out you're going to find out that somebody at some point talked about it maybe when they went away um, and begin to look even in the drawers of your house if you have things that belong to your family past look through those notes and some of those paper things that often uh, just kind of get shuffled around you may find business cards membership cards notes receipts all of those things tell us a little bit more about the stories and as we look at some of the resources I remind you these first fraternal organizations um, were in the 1700s and probably went back way before that time period because we know the Masonic order went back a full probably 150 years prior to that or more locate the records use the manuscript collections find the clues that an individual was a member of fraternal organization those biographies look at the clothing the jewelry listen to the family traditions read the obituaries look through the personal papers and if they have died look at their tombstone are there symbols that perhaps we've accepted as not being unusual that would tell us more about them in your handout I've given you a list of reminders of how to do this and there's a good list of web resources it's not comprehensive but it'll get you started know there's more 
And there's a bibliography of, of several books that I would recommend if you're focused on a particular group or um, there's Axel Rod's International Encyclopedia. That's one of the Facts on File books that was uh, an excellent source of finding a lots of groups, a lot of organizations that you might not find on the web. And lots of more options about some of the style and groups. And there's also an encyclopedia of associations that's maintained by Gale Research out of Detroit. Uh, that may help you as well. Probably there at your local library. Now, what do you do next? Just like everything else, sit back and think about it. Begin to look through the process. Ask the questions. Begin to dig through the information. As you learn more, we might find more opportunities to talk about what they did. If you find the minutes, then take the time to actually read them, see what's happening. You will find letters often included You'll find people reprimanded if that's the area. And read more than just about your ancestor because it'll help you understand the organization to which they belong. And if they were a member, you want to know what their participation was. Now, I appreciate you listening with me. Just this was a quick session for me, and it was more to get you into the record. If you learn more about these, if you find things that you think are very interesting and you want to share it, let me know. I'd be glad to hear from you. You have my email address. And thanks for listening, and thanks for being a part of this little discussion this morning about Masonic Lodges, Oddfellows, and Secret Societies. Good luck in your research.